Uh, Madeline Mays Automaton, a research studio transforming industrial robots into sentient companions, exploring the human body as an interactive design canvas and illustrating an embodied vision for the future of digital making. Her work blends disciplinary knowledge from design, robotics, and human-computer interaction to innovate at the edges of digital creativity. She holds an MR from Florida International University and is very, very close to completing a PhD in computational design at Carnegie Mellon. And her lecture is made possible by a grant from the ISU Women's and Diversity Grant, recently renamed the Inclusion Initiatives Grant Program, and is co-sponsored by the Department of Architecture, Department of Art and Visual Culture, Department of Graphic Design, and Department of Landscape Architecture. And those grants also supported a workshop and exhibition, which will be opening in the College of Design Gallery right after this. And there'll be snacks if you don't want to just come for the robots. Um, but please, we're very excited to have Madeline here. Please join me in welcoming Madeline again. Thank you all so much. I'm, I'm so happy you made it uh, to the lecture during you know, the next week. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Madeline Gannon. I am a designer, a researcher, and a robot whisperer. Um, but I didn't begin life as a robot whisperer. I um, began as an aspiring architect. Uh, and here in Miami, at Florida International University. Um, my architectural education is fundamental to how I view and explore the world. And during my six years there, um, something kind of amazing happened. I, I fell in love. And I fell in love with the machine. I fell in love with the CNC router. I fell in love with the Techno 4848L series router. And really, this for me, it was an intoxicating experience, head over heels. It was the first time I could take my six years of, of training and how to imagine things that don't exist in the world, build it in a computer, and bring it out back into the world in an almost direct conduit. And I was smitten. So I started to make things. I started to tinker in um, software and make things out of physical material. And quite quickly, I started to do things that that machine was never designed to do. And more importantly, that the software for the machine was never designed to do. Um, and it was the beginning of an obsession. Now all of a sudden, I was dedicating my life to figure out how I can talk to these machines, these powerful machines that can translate the digital world into physical matter in ways that, that can be um, exploratory and experimental and it expands my own imaginative creativity. So um, the first thing I had to do was learn how to program. Um, six years in architecture school at the time did not give you that knowledge. I started building tools, interactive tools, that would help me make and design my own things. Uh, tools that connected to CNC machines. So now I can have a sort of a fluid uh, trial and error process between designing something in a computer and getting it out in the physical world as quick as possible. And in making those interactive tools, these interactive softwares, I discovered that I could actually interact with this virtual world with more than just my mouse and my keyboard. And that's kind of where we are today, um, coming from aspiring architect to robot whisperer. Um, so now we can, that's just a bit of background on me and, and why I'm here, and we're going to talk about a lot of weird stuff that doesn't quite look like architecture, but believe me, my, I have a heart and mind of an architect, and that's, that's the way that I explore these big and trench problems across design, art, robotics, and HCI, human-computer interaction. Um, so, as shall be mentioned, I have a, a research studio at Tonaton. We are dedicating ourselves to finding better ways to communicate with machines that make things. And one of the areas that we're looking at right now is reimagining the future of automation. Uh, I'm based in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh and automation have a really interesting history together that goes back 50 years. Um, as the robotics capital of North America, it's also an example of post-industrial city in the U.S. Um, 
Automation is an incredible technology. It can make things better, faster, cheaper, and safer, so our commodities can be more accessible to a wider swatch of the socioeconomic population. Um, and the machines here have amazing superpowers. They have superhuman speed and superhuman endurance, reliability, <coughs> precision, and strength. But today, we see automation um, and the rate at which automation is happening in our society, and it's coming at a great human cost. The balance of power between machines and robots are beginning to tip into the machine's favor. <coughs> and while robots are replacing people in the labor market, is rightfully scary. I don't believe that this is the way our future should be. I believe, in, excuse me, I believe we can use the tools of automation to enhance, augment, and expand our capabilities and not replace them. And that's the future that I work to build. better ways to communicate with machines that can make things. For a long time, industrial robots have been the culprit of automation and replacing human labor. Basically, all the easy tasks to automate have been automated. Now what we're working on is um, using these tools to enhance or augment human labor. And that to me is very exciting. Industrial robots are really fantastic CNC machines you put a different tool at the end of the arm and all of a sudden they can do a whole different thing. So in the morning you can be doing spot welding, in the evening you can be doing painting. It's just highly adaptable. Another thing that I'm really working towards is finding ways to bring these machines out of factories and into live environments. So onto construction sites or onto film sites. There's chance for unpredictable objects like people to be moving into the environment. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to build the system to give this robot eyes so that it could actually see me and we can safely collaborate in a shared space. If I'm wearing or if I'm holding these motion capture markers, it knows where I am in space, it knows how I'm moving in space, now all of a sudden we can give the machine a nuanced understanding of our intention in that space. You can get someone who's never seen a robot before and have them begin to do creative things with just a couple minutes of interacting with the machine. So a central theme in how I explore the future of automation is human-centered design. When you engage with technology today, for the most part, the burden is placed on you to know that tech, to understand that tech, to understand this black box of magic that happens on the inside. Uh, you have to take the tutorials. You have to understand the concepts behind it. Human-centered design sort of converts this relationship. Um, it works to build a shared understanding between a person, a machine, and the built environment. And in that sense, um, what I do with my background in architecture is take my hypersensitivity to how people move through space and embed that understanding into machines. Um, but I didn't begin by uh, playing with these big, giant, monstrous robots. Um, I actually began from the software world by exploring how we can design things with virtual creatures, not mechanical creatures. So I imagine a lot of people here have 3D modeled before, uh, maybe even 3D printed, and it can be quite difficult to learn this tool. Again, the burden is on you to know how to 3D model something so that it can be printed by a 3D printing machine. Um, what I sought to do was to build a way to reach into the computer, to create something with this virtual creature, this squid, that neither of us could have created uh, by our own, and try to find a way to stretch the boundary of my own imagination.
So in designing with these virtual creatures, um, I embed the technical knowledge of an experienced fabricator directly into the anatomy of these squids. So here we see this module, the squid module. It's built out of a system of springs and particles. Uh, those springs keep everything connected, no matter how I manipulate it with my hand. The particles keep everything inflated, no matter how much I disrupt the, the actual squid and guide it around. Um, those particles actually also keep it from intersecting the 3D scan of my body. So if the squid, if I move my hand around, the squid actually goes around it. Um, these things all culminate into this embedded logic that makes this virtual um, ephemeral thing able to be sent to a 3D printer. And by embedding this physical knowledge into virtual geometry, something amazing happens when you give it a way to come out of the computer and into the real world. This virtual anatomy becomes this when 3D printed and brought back into our environment. The system is called Reverb. It lets you design uh, ready-to-print, ready-to-wear designs around your own physical body. Um, because, because we're working with a, 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 a logical virtual module that we're interacting with, everything is designed to fit and designed uh, to print immediately. So just by interacting with a squid in virtual space in seconds, you can create these intricate geometries that um, get these strangely anatomical features um, while pushing the absolute boundaries of this fabrication technology. And you get these exquisite resulting forms that conform to it and yet deviate from the body. And just subtle ways where it can drape around the shoulders or rest on the neck. All because this uh, intense human-centered knowledge and fabrication knowledge is embedded into this custom design tool. Uh, this was a really satisfying experience for me. I felt like I could reach into the virtual environment and I had a way, although you know, it took two weeks to get the 3D prints back from the service bureau, I had a way to really quickly iterate and get something out into the physical environment. Um, so this idea, you know, I have this virtual geometry, I, I can reach into the computer, can I bring that geometry out of the computer and into the environment to interact uh, directly with me? And if we're going to design things for the body, we might as well design things on the body. Your arm, 
that can detect all of these things that can be quite useful for 3D modeling. <coughs> so this is a demo. Um, I'm making a, a wristband for a uh, smartwatch, a Moto360 smartwatch. And this is quite interesting because um, unlike working with 3D modeling, where you're in a, a computer, you're in a virtual environment, here I'm working entirely at a one-to-one -one scale on the actual context that this thing is going to go back on. And I can actually use the Moto 360 as a prop to um, worry about orientation or fit or alignment on this. Um, with this demo, what I also tried to explore is how can we balance imprecise texture. So um, one thing that's great about working with a mouse that is very, very precise. For me, with Tafcom, it has the precision of your finger. So it's about two centimeters. So it's not that precise. It's not going to let me design clasps or clips for the smartwatch. Um, but I can parametrically attach those to the model, make them in an environment like Rhino, like Maya, like a conventional environment that's good for 3D modeling, and have these open gestures to do the overall design and orientation and that sort of stuff. So uh, with Reaper, I was able to develop a way to make intelligent geometry um, that had some autonomy and creativity uh, and was a companion and a collaborator in the design process. With Tactum, I found a way to bring that geometry out of the computer and into the real world to see and respond to my body. With both these systems, um, I'm outputting that intelligent geometry to a 3D printer, a three-axis robot. Um, so my next thought was, if I'm sending this intelligent, autonomous, virtual geometry to a three-axis robot 3D printer, why can't I send it to a six-axis robot, a robotic arm? Um, and, and long story short, there is a, a fairly good reason why no one has done this before. Um, these are fairly dangerous machines, and as you scrape through the user manual, you are just bombarded with visions of your impending doom. Um, yeah, you know, we are soft, squishy flesh, they are hard and steel, and those two things don't often mix well. And we even see that in industry. So here, this is kind of like state of the art for human-robot interaction, human-robot collaboration in a factory setting. And really, it's a these things do not mix. They are oil and water. Um, but part of being an outsider to the world of robotics, coming from a design background, coming from an architecture background, is that you often don't know um, the things that you're not supposed to do. Um, so I made a back massaging robot. This here is, is the first ever back controlled interface for a robot. So it has some pressure sensors in the head, and you know, like this was really inspired. I was really, really frustrated programming this robot, so I decided to make it give me a massage, and that might make the programming go easier. So if I lean harder back into it, it pushes harder and gives me a deeper massage. If I lean forward, it sort of softens it a lot, and we have this kind of uh, dance together. I've also worked on a lot of projects to bring sort of hacking master robots, bringing open source hardware um, onto these incredibly expensive machines so that we can actually uh, do something quickly and creatively um, on the end of this robot because the robot is only as good as what's on the end of it. I've also helped develop open source software for doing creative things with robotic arms. Here we have the same motion tracking that was used that I was using for the big orange robot. Now we're using a, a smaller robot with an adorable oopy eye. <laughs> but real applications here for, for puppetry or character animation that you can just sketch in midair, that there's no barrier between your imagination and the technology uh, to actually do it. And this has been a really obsessive theme in my research studio, is what can we do to explore the alternative relationships to these machines that perhaps have been overlooked or underutilized by industry in their pursuit of automation. And um, I was incredibly fortunate about a year ago to be able to test these ideas in the wild. Um, so I got an invitation from the Design Museum in London to contribute one of 11 installations uh, to one of their inaugural exhibits, Fear and Love. Uh, the curator asked me to tackle complex issues that our world is facing. For me, that was automation. Automation is a good thing, automation is a scary thing. How do we get people to kind of grapple with the realities of, 
uh, how do we need to deal with it. And working with my, my big orange guy here, um, I, I was surprised at how uh, much of a bond I formed with it, working with it every day. It almost seemed like a, like a puppy that I was training, like a lion that I was training is probably um, a little more accurate. And it demonstrated um, that the potential for this machine to really operate dynamically in a physical environment. And it kind of reminded me of, of kind of feats of daring between trainers and giant beasts, or the idea of um, seeing exotic creatures in uh, unfamiliar places. So I decided to bring an industrial robot into the design museum to live there for six months. Um, this was an incredible opportunity for me to bring this machine that is usually in a factory or on a car line into a public setting and uh, to engage with people who have probably never come face to face with this machine that is so influential and so impactful in how the world is built today. Um, this required a lot of technical development. From going from my orange robot where it's just me and a space uh, with this robot in a um, trained closed course scenario with experienced people to this thing living unsupervised in the wild on another continent for six months. Um, the main thing is, is how is the robot going to see us? So I can't, in a museum setting, I can't hold a marker or give everyone a marker. They'll walk away with it, they'll drop it, something will happen. It has to be markerless sensing. So I developed a way to track people from above. So here you have a bird's eye view of what the robot is seeing. These sensors are mounted into the ceiling. Um, they're mounted all around the perimeter of her enclosure, and they're seeing people from, from above. They're, they're detecting depth. These are depth cameras. And with this blobby information, we can actually extract a lot of useful knowledge that can help the experiential design, interaction design with the robot. So here, for example, we not only do we know someone's height and where they're located in space, but we know how long they've been there. We know how close they are to me. We know how active they are, if they're really excited or if they're kind of bored. Um, these are all things that I can use to rank who the most interesting person in that room is for the robot to go check out. So there was a lot of heavy lifting um, in the tech development to get this working. But actually communicating to a robot is fairly simple. Um, that's the, the straightforward part. So a robot, just like all of the CNC machines, you need to give it a point and an orientation in order to control it. Um, that's it. That's what the robot needs. What that looks like in the abstract is a little bit like this. So here I have a plane and I have an orientation. And I can give that to a robot and the robot will go there. It's, it's really that simple. But by embedding some physical knowledge into this virtual geometry, something amazing happens when you find a way to give the geometry a way out of the computer and into the physical world. So here's my robot there installation. That point in that plane, when you connect it to physical bodies and physical spaces, transforms into a lifelike creature to interact with. So this is Mimas. Um, she's no longer at the Design Museum, she's back to work at the factory line, unfortunately, her holiday is over. Um, but you can see a couple elements here. Um, the, she has a glass enclosure around her that's quite different than the orange robot where it's just me inches away from it. Um, that was quite necessary because, again, this is going to be unsupervised for six months and in a public setting. So uh, a lot of what I tried to do is play up that, that um, feeling of, of Mimas as a caged creature in the zoo. And to bring her to life, I worked to connect her body language to the body language of visitors. Um, but there's a very constrained material palette with this robot. You have her posture, her movement, and the sound of her motors. That's really all you have to work with. She doesn't look like us, she doesn't act like us. And yet I have to somehow create some empathic bond between her and visitors. I was um, really surprised 
surprise, you know, like for me, I had a nanny man to watch her over here, but I was able to follow along on social media for how people were uh, receiving things in the wild. And I was surprised at the way we were able to cultivate an empathic, meaningful bond with people would just oppose emotion and sound. Um, and there was a range of, of things we were able to elicit from uh, friendly curiosity or to something um, maybe a little more flirtatious and maybe a little more rude. Um, and also importantly, uh, a little bit tricky and maybe a little bit distrusting. These machines are coming out of, the, of our labs, out of our tech companies, and into our physical environments. Not necessarily just for robots, but large, autonomous, non-humanoid machines like driverless cars and drones. Uh, especially in a place like Pittsburgh, where I'm from, that's an everyday occurrence for me now when walking down the sidewalk. Um, so these are all important feelings that we as a society need to have ways of processing and evaluating what is the future that we want to see, what is preferable. Shapes the 
cities. Uh, have you thought about how the automatic vehicle should be designed as opposed to how it's about to be? Or yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, much. We march towards the future looking in our rear view mirror. You know, the first cars were the horseless carriages. Our autonomous vehicles are the driverless cars. So what they will be in the future, I think, is it's hard to really speculate on what it will be. What we would like it to be is an important conversation for everyone to get engaged with. So for me, there's two things that need to happen. There's the, the experience of the person inside that and how they're being transported by this vessel. And there's experience of, of the people in the public space that um, are, are now being affected by this technology that, that they don't know yet. They didn't ask for it to be here. Um, so building some legibility through the physical design of that car, I think is going to be critical. So with the Google car, this is a little, little tiny cute clown car, um, they use they use some things to, to make it seem less threatening. Cute is often used with robots to make it seem less threatening. But that often doesn't allow enough legibility or transparency into what that machine is doing. Um, so we can have a cute robot in our house that also has a camera behind or that's recording us. And it's not, there's no real design language about the ethics of things that are intelligent to share in our space with us. So that's an active area of research, a really interesting area of research. If you guys want to look into it more, it's called social robotics. So it's a whole subfield of human robot interaction. And what, what is the happening that the car is the same car? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Because I mean, the car, not just the experience, it's just the experience, it's the Exactly. Yeah. And the idea of car ownership as well is something that so this is something that's it's, it, it's policy level, it's design level, it's uh, municipalities. All everything will be transformed by cars that drive themselves. And we'll probably won't even call them cars. All right. So you've been taking tools and uh, repurposing them. Have you started redesigning or taking the information you've learned from these studies to redesign some of these tools? Have you, you know? found maybe better angles for the Volvos to operate at on articulation, for example. What was your example? Uh, well, uh, the Altegna was on the Volvos, so the arms where they you know, were yeah. redesigning them. That's a great question. The, the, I, love, I love working with off-the-shelf machines, right? Because in one way, it's like, look, this tool has been around for 50 years, and look what you've overlooked. There's amazing potential for it to unleash its amazing superpowers in ways that we've never dreamed of before because they've just been kind of stuck in factories. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is, is a little bit maybe ego-driven to say, like, guys, you miss this obvious thing here. Um, there's a lot of benefits to working with these machines, too. Like, you have a 100% recycle. If something fails, it's not the machine, it's my code. Whereas if, all, if I'm also trying to build the hardware, too, um, then, then there could be more error built into it. Um, some of the way that it's fed back into it with industrial robots is around safety. So for the Design Museum of London, I worked with ADB Robotics, my, my in-kind sponsor for it, and we had to come up with safety standards that went beyond the international guidelines. Because they're designed for um, the, the fencing around it, for example. It's designed for factories. So kids aren't going to be in factories for the most part. Um, there's an eight-inch gap between the bottom of the panel and the floor that is the, the minimum requirement in the factory. Uh, we had to actually childproof this for, for the design museum. So in some ways, beginning to take these out of their original context is, is giving some feedback to industry on, on what needs to happen in order for these machines, whatever the physical form might transform into in the future, uh, has to engage with the public. Thank you. So I guess this is a question about the way that you cross disciplines. Um, what are the challenges that you face doing that? What are the freedoms? What do you? What are your thoughts on that? Because this is, you know, a college of design, and we'd like to think that we have this ability to be fluid between disciplines. But just your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I work in a kind of not interdisciplinary space, 
but anti-discriminatory space. Um, so that's that's kind of the the, the world where I plant my feet. Um, there are benefits to that, and there are definitely challenges. <laughs> Sorry. The benefits are um, you can approach something with kind of an amateurish vigor uh, because you don't know what you're not supposed to do. The challenge to that is that you're approaching it with an amateurish vigor and that you don't know what you're not supposed to do. So you can go down some rabbit holes in that case. Um, knowing what you don't know is a really great skill to have. And that took me um, quite a bit of time to build up that background knowledge um, so that I could decide, is this a hard problem? Is this an easy problem? Should I go after this? What are the missing pieces to this puzzle for these industries, different silos of disciplines that aren't really talking to each other? Um, I do my best to occupy that in-between space, in-between art, design, technology, and uh, robotics. Um, the challenges of that are that I don't quite fit in anywhere. I'm a little bit of a black sheep. Um, and gaining traction and support can be really uh, difficult. Um, having well-documented work and uh, adding animated gifts to your emails when you cold call someone is really, really helpful to get people to pay attention to you. Please talk to me. So, thank you all. So we'll